In this video, we are going to cover some of the options that we have if we are interested in doing an association analysis. That will include cross tabulations, correlations, partial correlations, simple linear regression, and multiple linear regression. As you can see, I already opened R Commander, and the first thing that I'm going to do is to go and change the working directory so it will be in the folder where I keep all of my files. The second thing that I'm going to do is to go and open a file. Once more, I'm going to just load a data set of files that I have created before, and this is the same example that we have been following all along. So I have the self-playing data. And as you can see, it loaded, and I want to see what my file looks like. So this is, these are some of the variables that I have in my file. You might remember that we have been using this file for a while now. And the plan will be that now we are going to use some of these variables to do um, cross tabulations and partial correlations, correlations, linear, um, simple, and multiple regression. Association between variables that are categorical is what we sometimes know in SPSS as cross tabulations or cross tabs. And they are usually analyzed by looking at the cell counts on each one of the cells of the tables and then trying to determine if, the, um, if there is some kind of association between the different cells. In order to accomplish that in our data set, what we need to do is to do, in fact, some recoding of some of the variables. You might remember that we have already recoded sex as two categories, but we need to go and redo that part for the um, other variables. You might remember, if you happen to see some of the previous videos, that we can accomplish that by going into the bin and as a numerical variable. And that's the menu that I have open right now. The variable that I selected that I want to create into a category will be age, and I'm going to call that age categorical because I do want to keep my age variable as it is in case that I want to do something later with that information. The way that I did it before and I'm going to do again is that I'm going to create about six bins and then I'm going to use the option to create ranges. I'm basically going to say that I want to create range of, of values and they are going to, e to be of equal width. So once that I select these options, I'm going to click on OK and you will see that now I have here one new command that says that I already did that. What you see now on the um, screen is the new variable that I created that is called age categorical. And here you can see that it's already doing some kind of categorical analysis of the information. So now that I have two categorical variables, I can go into statistics, summaries, and I can, oh, sorry, conting, contingency tables, and I can create a two-way table. So you can see here that I have row variables, and it's asking me to pick one. So I'm going to pick age categorical, and for the columns, I'm going to select sex. Um, I do have here some options for the type of statistics that I want to get as part of the output, and I'm going to ask to have percentage of total. You can also ask for row or column percentages, and I'm going to ask for the chi-square test of independence. So with all of that information, I'm ready to go, and I just click on OK, and I get the output. You might have heard a faint beep, which is the way that R Commander, or R in general, will let me know that there is some kind of issue with what I just did. And you can see that here at the bottom it says, four expected frequencies are less than five. So if we go to the table, you can see that here we have that for this age group, I have one male and zero females, and then here, we also have for the, the oldest group, um, one male and two females. If you're not familiar with chi-square, 
you may not know this, but chi-square will usually not work very well when you have less than 5, and that is why we have that specific message. Uh, so one thing that I can do is go back, change the age categorical option from 6 to 5. That may fix the problem, but before I do that, I uh, want you to see that here we have the counts for each one of the combinations. Here we have the percentages that I got for the females and males and the total. So this will be what are known as the marginals. Finally, at the bottom, we have the result of the chi-square analysis. In this case, the chi-square is 14.591. Because we have 5 degrees of freedom, this value will be significant. And what that means is that in this particular case, there is some level of association between the age and the sex. Offline, I play a little bit more with the bean option to try to find the optimal number of beans because I was running into some problems. The same thing where it was saying that um, I had less than five counts on each one of the cells. Eventually, I found that with three, it would work. So let me show you how I did it. I did go into manage variables and then bean numeric variable. I changed this to trim, as you can see, and then click on OK and it, I was able to get it to work. Now, what I did next was to go into contingency tables, two way table, and I basically kept the same thing, but this time I did go and change a couple of the options under statistics. In addition to having the chi-square, I also asked for the print expected frequencies and also for the components of the chi-square statistic. And the reason for doing that is that I wanted to know what particular cells were the ones that seemed to be creating the association. And the only way to know that would be by looking at the components of the chi-square and also looking at the expected frequencies. In some other packages within R, you can also ask for the residuals. Um, R Commander don't, doesn't give you that option at this point. So I'm going to show you what I was able to get when I did run this option. So now this is the new table where you can see that now we have 7 and 23 females for the first category, 44 and 91 for the second category, and 16 and 15 for the last category. The percentages had come out to be uh, 3.6, 11.7, 22.4, etc. And then the chi square was not significant if you set your p value at less than 0.05. For the sake of this exercise, I will set my p value as 0.1 just so we can go on with the interpretation of the rest of the printout. Um, you can see here what are the expected counts for each one of the different cells and the way that you can get a sense of whether there is, are some differences will be by um, com, uh, contrasting the values that you have for the observed values, this frequency table that you have here, versus the values that you get on the expected counts. Perhaps an easier way will be to just look at the chi-square components. The chi-square, this value 5.9074, can be decomposed into all of these values. So if you were to add 1.03 plus 0.54 plus 0.1 plus 0.05 plus 2.75 plus 1.43, you will get a number that will be very, very close to this. If it's not exactly that number, it will be just because of some rounding error. And the way that we use these values in this chi-square component is to try to find out which one of these values seems to be the largest, because that will be an indication that that is one of the cells where you have an imbalance between what will be observed and what is expected. We usually interpret these values to say that the association is related to some combination of these cells. In this case, if we were to as, uh, be okay with using a point 0.1, we could perhaps say that this um, specific cell, males for the largest category, seems to have more individuals than what we would expect. 
In the next part of the video, we will be looking into how to run correlations and partial correlations. So, we are going to start by running some correlations, and we have done this before. We just need to go into summaries, and then we like to run a correlation matrix. Um, the R commander is going to ask me what specific variables I want to select, and I'm going to select only three, just because it will be a little bit more difficult to have many more variables, especially when it comes to the interpretation of the partial correlations. You can see I have selected all the, already the variables, and here I have the type of correlations. I have Pearson, Spearman, this will be for ordinal variables, and I also have partial correlations. I will go into that in just a moment. And then I will ask for um, OK, and I will run the correlation. So here we have the result of the correlations between these three variables. And as you can see here, we have a relatively very small correlation between these two variables. And between back depression and this other variable, the correlation is a little bit higher, but not so much. Notice that here the, the correlation that seems to be the most critical is the correlation between two of the variables that start with MOH. And it is possible that it is because maybe they are part of a, uh, a scale that is trying to measure something. These are, in fact, a couple of items from the Mosher's sex yield scale. Given these correlations, one thing that we can do is to create a plot, a scatter pl using the scatter plot matrix option. So what we can do is select the specific variables that we want, and then just click on OK. And this will be the result of doing that scatter plot matrix. As you can see here, this will be the relationship between the back depression inventory and the Mosher sex yield item 1 and the Mosher sex yield item 2. This will be the relationship between Mosher sex yield num item number 1 and back depression. So this will be similar to this relationship here. And this will be between Mosher sex yield item 1 and Mosher sex yield item 2. And because they are symmetrical, you can see that this uh, relationship will be similar, this relationship will be similar to this, and this relationship will be similar to this. The only reason why they don't, they may not look the same is because the, the order of the variables is changing. So knowing what we know now, it will be perhaps even more interesting that we try to see how the correlation changes if instead of using Pearson, we do partial correlations. So I will just change from Pearson to partial, and then let's see what happens. The easiest way to interpret a partial correlation will be by saying that you are looking at the relationship between two variables, for example, back depression inventory and Mosher sex guilt item 1, while you are holding the other variables constant. As you can see here, there is a big change in the correlation from what we had before. I'm going to scroll up so you can see what was the correlation before. You can see that here it was almost zero, and now it is negative 0.18984. Compared to all of the other correlations, this seems to be the one that changed the most. When we scroll down to see the rest of the output, you can see that we have several values, in fact, all of them, that are statistically significant when we are using a two-sided p-value. And also, you might remember from before that we use this Holmes method, which is also known as Bonferroni Holmes, and it's a way to correct for the fact that you may be running multiple significance tests at the same time. So even though uh, we are running several significant tests, some of these values still have very similar significance to the ones that we got before. And the fact that we can look at the relationship between several variables while holding others constant seems to be the perfect sage way to go into regression. 
Before we go into multiple regression, which is the area where you can address these partial regressions, uh, we will start with a simple regression model. To continue with the example, what I will be doing is running a regression model where now we look at the Beck depression inventory as one of as the dependent variable and the Mosher sex guilt items as the independent variable. And the way to run linear regressions is from the menu on statistics you go down to fit models and you can see that here you will have a linear regression option. You can see that the menu gives you several options. For example, you can change the name of the, bar, the model. So perhaps we can call this simple regression. And I need to select my response variable, my dependent variable, which we say is going to be the back depression inventory. And the explanatory, as uh, we said before, we're going to be selecting the items that are part of the Mosher sex yield um, scale. And I'm going to select the first one for this case, just so we get a taste for what the outcome, the output of a simple regression model looks like. If this is um, something that you were trying to run for real, the results may be a little bit disappointing because what we find is that there is really no relationship between that Mosher sex guilt item and the Beck depression inventory. But let me just run through the output so you can understand what we get. The first thing that we get uh, some summary information about the residuals. We find what are the median, the minimum, and the maximum scores. You Ideally, you want to have residuals that very look very um, normally distributed. We don't really know if these are normally distributed or not, but we can run some diagnosis to see what they look like. The other thing to notice is that here we have the results of my regression model. We find that the intercept was significant. You can see that it has here three stars. That is the same as saying that the value is less than, is equal to 0 0.001. But for the Mosher sex guilt item, we find that the value is not significant. Notice that the P is almost equal to 1. Some other things that you can get from this outcome, this output, is we get the residual standard error, the number of degrees of freedom. It's saying that one of the observations was deleted, so instead of having 194 observations. Now we only have 193. And then we have the multiple R square, which is um, an indication of the amount of variance explained. The fact that we have 7.74 e to the minus 5 means that I have basically four zeros and then a 7. So that means that we are not explaining any uh, of their uh, variance. The adjust R square is a correction that you include for when you have more than one single sim uh, independent variable. So we're going to skip that for now. And then we have the F statistic, which will be like an F test. And here will be the P value associated with the model. And just as um, a cautionary to, uh, note, um, the F value is associated with the entire model and sp but specifically with the independent variables so you can have an intercept that is significant as we have here and yet your model is not going to be significant just to conclude this part of the video what i want to do next is to create a scatter plot that will have the two variables that i selected so i'm going to have Beck depression as my Y variable and Mosher sex guilt um, item one as my uh, independent variable. Then I'm going to go into the options and this time I'm going to add a list squares line so we can see what happened. I'm also going to include a title and I'm going to call this simple regression model 
PDI versus Mosher in scale item one. I'm gonna click on that and this is the plot that I get from that specific um, request. And I'm sure that you will understand now why is it that we are saying that there is no relationship between the Beck Depression Inventory and the Mosher Sex Guild uh, Scale Item 1. Um, one way to interpret this line that is running across is that it's basically parallel to the x-axis and when we have something like that we speak about no relationship between the two variables. To make this point even stronger I decided to go back we can go back to the scatter plot and then as options we can add plot concentration ellipses so we can see now what are the expected distribution of the scores based on the data that we have and this is the result Usually when you have some kind of association between two variables, you will expect that what you have, instead of being more like a circle like we have here, it will be more like an ellipse and it will probably go in this direction if it's a positive relationship or in this direction if it is a negative relationship. Just to complete the exercise, I'm going to show you how you can run some diagnosis on the model if you had something that was worth checking so i'm going to go into models as you see here and under models you will have at the very bottom several options we're going to explore some of the graphs and to see what happens one of them that i'm in particular interested to check will be the what is called the qq plot because it allows you to determine how normal the residuals are so i click on that and then I go and automatically ask for any potential outliers and I click on that and this is the result of the QQ plot. One thing to notice is that we have the line that is running through the center and then that is, um, it has two sets of, a uh, set of two dotted lines running parallel to it. Um, the dots will indicate the residuals and they will be um, determining based on this plot whether they seem to be within what may be considered as a normal distribution. So in other words, if the values seem to be within the two dotted lines, then you can usually say that they are more or less fitting into what might be considered a normal distribution. The fact that we have several points on this end of the tail that seem to be totally out of the what might be considered a normal distribution seem to indicate that perhaps we have a slightly biased distribution. The only other analysis that I'm going to run on this model will be to go again into graphs and this time I'm going to ask for the basic diagnostic plots. And this is what we get. You may be familiar already with this. This is the QQ plot that we ran before. This is residuals versus fitted, sometimes it's also known as residuals versus white hat. And what you want to be able to identify from this plot is that you don't have any trends, nothing that seems to be indicating that perhaps you have something that is affecting the outcome of your model. Then here we have standardized residuals versus white hat, and this is to check the homogeneity. Ideally, you don't want to have anything that looks like perhaps, again, there is some kind of trend in the data. You can see that here you have, in addition to that, the line that is providing something like the mean score for all of the scores that you have here, all the points. You can see that you don't seem to have anything that will indicate that there is some kind of trend. And then finally, we have the residuals versus leverage. This is intended for to detect influential observations. And you can see that we seem to have most of the values are close to zero here. We have this item here that perhaps may be a little bit of a potential problem. Um, if we had more time, perhaps we can go and do a little bit of research about this point and try to understand if there is something that perhaps may be affecting the fit of the distribution. But for now, this is where I will stop. Finally, what we will do is to run a multiple regression model.
In the procedure to run a multiple regression model is similar to what we did already, which is going to statistics, fit models, but notice that this time what we're going to be doing is fitting the back depression inventory, but we're going to try to fit these three variables as part of my regression model. I'm going to change this to multiple regression, so we know that this is a different model. And I'm going to click on OK. And here we have the output of the model. It turns out that when I include these three items from the Mosher Sex Guild scale, <coughs> now I do have a significant model. So first of all, let's go again over the output so you can identify and understand what is going on. The very first part, as usual, will be a summary of the residuals. And again, we don't really have a, a good way to know if they are normal or not. But once more, we notice that we have what may be a potentially skewed distribution just based on these large scores that we have on one end of the distribution. The next thing to notice is that now that we have three independent variables, we have at least two of them that seem to be significant. This, you can see that the t-value is two minus 2.566, and that is a significant to p less than 0.05. And then we have here a t-value of 3.560, and that is significant to p less than 0.01. The model in general is significant. Um, we can see, however, that the R square is not really high. Basically, we are just explaining about 7% of the total variance. And notice that now the adjust R square is meaningful because now we have three variables. And the idea of the adjust R square is that it will introduce some correction based on the number of variables that you have in your model. Finally, we find that the F is also significant. We have that the model is significant with a P less than 0.05. One interesting thing to notice is the change for the specific variable, the first Mosher sex guilt item, from this value, which is minus 0.26, and the fact that this is significant now, to what we got before, which was basically zero, and it was not significant at all. So this gives some credence to the idea that when you have multiple variables, you are sort of controlling for the effect of some of the other variables into the model. However, it is also possible that there is something fishy going on. So in these type of cases, it's even more important that we check to see if there is some kind of um, multicollinearity effect or something else that is going on. Because of this suspicion, the first thing that we're going to do is to do some graphs. We're going to go get into the scatter plot matrix and we're going to ask for the back depression and the three other items from the Mosher Guild scale. We're going to go into options and this time we're going to ask for the histograms. The default is a density plot for the diagonal. And the other thing that we're going to be doing is that we're going to add a least square line uh, for each one of the uh, scatter plots. So let's see what we get. Oh, let's add a title here. So we will be saying a scatter plot BDI versus Mosher Guild, Mosher Sex Guild items. And this is the result of my uh, request. So first of all, notice that the VEC depression inventory seems to be biased. We probably have very low scores, many low scores, and then just a few high scores. Perhaps this explains why we seem to have something that looks like a non-normal distribution for the residuals. Here we have the histograms for the other three items. You can see that in general they look more or less normal. 
we probably have a little bit of skewness and some kurtosis. Um, and here is the information that we wanted to check. This is the relationship between item 1 and vector pressure. This will be the relationship between item 2 and vector pressure and between item 3 and vector pressure. The other thing to notice is the relationship between items 1 and 2 and items 2 and 3. And you can see that there may be a lot of relationship between those three items. In fact, that is probably not surprising considering that they are trying to perhaps target the same general construct. Now that we have a general sense for the fact that there may be something that is going on with the model, I'm going to go back into models and then look at some of the graphs that will help me with the basic diagnostic. This is the output that I get after I run that specific diagnostic plot. Um, you may be familiar with um, these charts already. So again, we can see that the residuals versus Y hat, they don't seem to have a big indication of some kind of trend. Same thing for the standardized residuals versus Y hat. And we don't seem to have something that can be identified as a trend. The QQ plot, in fact, shows that now we seem to have a more normal distribution than what we had before. And then here we have some indication that perhaps we have a few uh, scores that may, be, that may have some level of influence on the final model. As we said before, there may be some potential multicollinearity. So what I'm going to go and do now is to go straight and ask for a diagnostic associated with multicollinearity. This is what is known as the variance inflation factors. And we have the outcome here at the bottom. The way to read this information that we have now on the output is a sort of a rule of thumb. We usually speak about the fact that if we have variance inflation factors that are higher than five, then we can speak about some level of multicollinearity. As you can see here, none of the values are even close to this threshold of 5. So then technically we cannot say that we have any multicollinearity going on. The bottom of the printout shows you a conversion from a variance-covariance matrix to correlations. And what this is basically saying is trying to establish the correlation between the regression coefficients for each one of the variables that are included in the model. So if we were to have a high degree of multicollinearity, what might happen is that some of these correlations between some of the independent variables, the regression coefficients of some of these independent variables will be very, very high. But as you can see here, we don't seem to have anything that will be considered as a very, very high correlation. I'd like to conclude this section by just going back to the original output of the regression, multiple regression model, and to say that even though the model is statistically significant, the fact that we cannot really explain much of the total variance, just 0.07 of the total variance, will perhaps be an indication that you need to think a little bit more about what may be some of the variables that may be affecting your dependent variable.